three-piece suits and everything else really worked super back then. And now they're going back to them, on, especially out west. Yeah. They don't get snow in the back. I like it a lot more. Can you clap three times pretty loud right there for Thank you. So I can sync it later. <coughs> okay. Okay, so we got that kind of dune buggy thing. I remember you did a backtrack on that and there was a shot of it uh -huh. on a sand dune. That was really cool. This here is a, a 1968 race sled that was built by Polaris. They had the fuel tank in the rear. And uh, <clears throat> you'll see the funny grill here. They hand built the grill because they weren't getting enough air into the motor. The motor uh, was running hot, so they, they took it and uh, built this in the shop at night. And uh, you'll see it's a JLO. <clears throat> 744 motor it's a twin with megaphones the megaphones made about 126 dbas but what's unique about this is how they took a regular motor and built it into a race motor and uh, that's what the germans didn't really care for they wanted reliability and just a small tump 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 and uh, what uh, players did is they had to take and make a plate here to make it to bolt it to the chassis they made it free air turned the head sideways modified it and used uh, two hd carburetors on the side and a very simple operation with one one throttle cable going back and forth with a little wire in between the two so it's synchronized up with the throttle uh, this is the first use of their aluminum chain case and then they redid it as they went along this is still a steel tunnel but uh, it was a, a step ahead as they went along. This here is a, the seat that was redone. This plastic back here covered the fuel tank. It was kind of unique. It was all red and, and uh, everything. And I wondered if they had any surplus left over up in Rosso. So I went and talked to this one guy up there and he was a, uh, running a dyno. I says, do you remember? Do they have any of these around? Oh yeah, he says, we had a lot of them. I says, oh, is there any around now? Well, my wife used them to cover the tomatoes. <laughs> they really work good. So a lot of uh, spare parts that they had left over. But what we're trying to do is redo history, and that's what we did. Really nice example. Here's a nice example of Edgar Hattin. He built this sled when we had a gas shortage in 1975. And it's called the Trail Cat. And everything on it is hand built. The steering and the skis are, are regular production, but the rest of it's all sleek, modern, and it's narrow. And uh, they made 226 of these. He wanted to help with the gas shortage, and uh, they only made it one year this year. And what they did do is he put a 10 horsepower Briggs and Stratton in it and it'd go 22 miles an hour. Yet the sled looks like it'd go 80, the way it is. But it's advanced designing. Like I said, there wasn't very many of these around anymore, but it's really cool looking. As we go along. The gas tank is on, the cap is on the center of the seat like that? Yeah, right between. Oh, the, cause you sit back further. Right. I always think that. Yep, you sit back further. You just sit on it and, 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 and see how the seat feels. It's really, you know, the, the, how he made it, it, it's a plastic track, it's hinged together track on it. And then it had hand loops in the back on the tunnel. But uh, the way he made the seat and everything else is really cool. <clears throat> back in the day, in Cat had a lot of class. They had, well, they still do, but they, they had a lot of class. And they had a, a, a retired wrestler. And uh, he, he, they, they called him Inspector Henderson. And they were all looking for safety back then and all this stuff. So he was their chef. Now, I don't know if he did or who did they come up with. They decided to make a portable kitchen. So they called it a cutter kitchen. And you'll see the, the original one over here. And it has a barbecue grill, hot plate, and an oven on it. A range, high range on it. And you could take it out and... Uh, have have your food made out in the wild and they were very popular back then and uh, we still use this as of today inspector henderson things that he did and eagle river 
they even made a rubber bar um, jail that they pulled around to, uh, to make please the fans and everything else. And they took some racers and put them in there for the fun of it. And just, uh, it was advertising and it really worked great. Everyone back in the days had their colors and you'll see in the helmets and everything else that, that are on display here, everybody had a different type of color and you could pick out what colored helmet you had and stuff like that by what sled you rode. And it was a lot of pride in riding your sled uh, and <clears throat> dressing like they wanted to be. See, like Artie Cat had a lot of leopard skin on their stuff and, and they really had a lot of neat, neat stuff. Where Skidoo was all yellow and uh, which you could pick them right out. Orange was Modeski, and they went on and on. A lot of aftermarket, they had fuel additives back then, different oil. They had Super Blends All. It's a bean oil. Oh, what a nice smell it has on it. And we used to run that and just try the different things. Even Le Mans came with a can of nitro that you put in. I don't know if it was nitro in it, but uh, it's supposed to help out the racing and everybody wanted to go fast. So we were trying every little everything we could different things that they had uh, They had uh, this one here is so now you'll see an engine here and This was made by Bill Tenney. Bill Tenney was down in uh, in Western Minnesota in Monticello and he made a patent on this in 1969 with the intake and exhaust on the same side and when you dyno a motor, you always dyno a single cylinder to start out with. And this was a player's uh, concept, what he had. And then what he used is he could open the transfers to, to tell how much power he could have or more power without deadening it out. And, he, and the back port too, he could open and close it. And he made this into water cooled. This was a free air and made it into water cooled. And this patent that he had on this machine was in 1969 and Articat finally used the intake and exhaust on the same side. I think they used it in about 19, 2000. They utilized it. He came up with all different patents on, on different concepts of his motors. He would take and make them in pieces so he could build bigger transfers and, and put different things on them. Here's his patent on this motor here. And he, he run them on a, on a crankcase and then uh, could tell how much horsepower he was making. He was he was always innovative in that respect, and he liked outboard racing, and uh, he used, utilized it a lot. Everybody was coming up with different things, and this is called a gem aftermarket, and this was to put two HLs on and adapt more carburation to try to get more fuel into the engine to make more power. Now this one here, he built this motor here, and this is a, 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 a brute cylinder that he put a top place on here so it didn't break off made his own crankcase and then used reeds to induct it into the into the crankcase <clears throat> most everybody was uh, still he was always working on different things and and ingenuity was trying to help make more power what happened back then the germans nothing wrong with the germans but they wanted just regular power they didn't couldn't see us making so much power and uh, we would blow up engines and they they wanted reliability we wanted to go faster so we got more free air motors more horsepower we were up around 800 cc's and even the speed runs were more than that players and, and everybody after 1975 they started making water cool already already cat was too that uh, water cooling makes the motor run cooler with more horsepower but it's still you have to have a water pump and you have to have coolers when they were <clears throat> testing first they always had a megaphone like this. this is a gem megaphone all spun aluminum this really worked and when i was racing i i bought one of these and i put it on a scorpion it was super i thought boy this is really nice it was loud but i wore, wore earplugs and I was racing a cross-country race, and the, and the sound changed a little bit. By the time I came in here, it, the spun aluminum had melted. It got so hot. And uh, so I had to take, throw that away. But it was uh, fun while it lasted. And we were, try, we were always trying different things. And you'll see different 
uh, pipes and different concepts of, of uh, aluminum pipes and steel pipes. And some, you can see the stingers here. Uh, this is for high tor uh, torque and not too much RPM. And this one here is really high, high RPM. And uh, they, they had a hard time clutching them back in those days. Uh, back in the days, they, they had different types. Of, we could make our own manifolds. We were making manifolds to get more fuel into each cylinder. And uh, we, a lot of guys would we'd have to adapt everything to make them work uh, to get them more horsepower. With more horsepower, we even had to go to a steel corded belt because most belts wouldn't take over 50 horse. So anytime you got over 50 horse, you'd have to go with a steel corded belt. It's very stiff. And what you do is you take and warm this up in your vehicle and then put it on the sled just before you went out and raced. But it, it did the job. And, and that's the main thing as we went along. The cylinders and everything else, they were all cast iron. Most of these are hearth cylinders. And this, this here is how the transfers. This is how much fuel goes into the motor. And we run, back then we ran three ring pistons. Then the reason they ran three rings is for durability. But as we engineered more horsepower, then they started making the transfers bigger. And then we went to two rings, and then we went to, to an L ring, and then we used to cut the piston skirt here, and then bore holes in the side of the piston and make uh, back ports in it to make more power. How long did it take the evolution of this one to that one? Uh, about, about two years, two to three years. And this is just kind of testing on a track? and. Well, it tested on the dyno too, and the track. And then the guys, a lot of the stuff that we adapted here was uh, from motorcycles too. Okay. Because motorcycle technology was way ahead of everything else. And uh, as we went along the bigger transfers and we went from a cast iron uh, cylinder to aluminum cylinder with chrome or with a steel sleeve. Back in the day, we, the, what they were testing for and, and everything was a, this is called a, uh, <coughs> it was called a Bing carburetor. And this is what the U Europeans used. This was their choke. They used to go like that to make a choke very simple and then reliable. And then they, all they did is had a hand opening the throttle up and then, but this wasn't as reliable. This didn't put as much power out. So we started right away with get the motors without the carburetors. And then they, uh, the manufacturers put their own carburetors on. And that was Tillerson carburetors mostly. Back in the days, a lot of used, we used Salisbury clutches. And then players had a steel clutch and they even sold this to Articat for a while. And it was a very good clutch. It was a steel clutch, it still is reliable, but it wasn't, it didn't uh, make the belts last as long. Here's a cutaway of a Polaris clutch. And it's all aluminum, how this slide goes up and down. To this day, they're mainly, this was one of the things that Polaris made that really worked well. To this day, they still use the same concept. Uh, maybe a little bit different each manufacturer, but this is the most efficient way to transfer power. Aluminum here and aluminum on the driven as we went along. There were more advancements as we went through the industry. Um, we, uh, to get more power and everything else, as the industry grew, we even went to aluminum, a steel tube, and then to, without twisting the, the drive sprockets off. Back in the old days, we just had the drive sprockets and they would put too much power and they would tear the sprockets apart. This is advanced, this is back, this is up in the 80s and 90s as we went. We started out with pizza cutters to cut into the snow and the, a little bit of ice. We were mostly racing on snow than anything else. Where would that go on? A on the ski. You put that on the ski and when you turn the ski, and it would tip like this and then would cut in. Huh. It would go in the middle, uh, right underneath the ski spindle. <laughs> and we call them pizza cutters. And then we used a lot of golf shoe studs and stuff like that. And then we put it in our tracks. And then we come up with the claws, the cat claws and stuff like that. And then what really set us ahead with this Talonic cleat had teeth on it. This really helped a lot on uh, 
especially on our cleated tracks of Polaris and Arctic. Skidoo still had rubber tracks and they had to use these cloth type studs. And then as we went along, we got lighter cleats and lighter weight. And then we went into carbide. This is a carbide wear rod. Before that, we used a three quarter file and we welded that on our wear rod. And then we sharpened that razor sharp and we used it to race on. And we have different styles of carbides as we went along. This is a rivet tool. This here, you, you put the rivet in and then you take a, a punch and hammer it down. This was before we had good hand rivet guns and, and uh, to rivet the cleats. This here is a, a piece that we put on the ski that would, as the ski turned like this, it would dig into the snow and get us around the corner. And that was mostly for racing, but some guys used it for regular production. This is a cast iron megaphone and uh, it just, not too many people used it because they're afraid to break the cylinder if they ever hurt this. So you see them every once in a while, but they still made 126 dBAs, which was a lot of, lot of noise. It just, it gives it a little bit of back pressure and uh, it gives you about a horse and a half, maybe power, whereas a, a tuned pipe will give you a lot more than that. And uh, it just, it's, it's better than a, a straight pipe. So it, it does give an effect besides it's loud and you feel like you're going faster than you are. Yeah. It just, and uh, very, you know, back then we just tried everything. This is another motor like, you, like I told, showed in that one race sled. Very lucky to have this part of history. And this was the first uh, twin cylinders that uh, Polaris had, it's a JLO. And uh, see they, they uh, crankcase, they had to build this piece out here to mount it, mount it in back in here, but this is a mounting area. And this was a 384 cc motor and then they made it and built it so that it was a 744 with different 372 cylinders on it added so it was trying to get horsepower back then and using every possibility of what they tried, wanted to find wherever they could this is called a, a stusco dyno and this was made in denver uh, colorado and what it does is it tells the horsepower of the motor and what you do is hook it up to water, and then as you're revving up the motor uh, with it coupled up to here, then you could put this on and you could tell the horsepower and the torque. And that way when you're running, uh, <clears throat> when you're designing a pipe, and this is even the muffler pipes that they do nowadays, they usually design it in five stages. You got your first stage, your second stage, your mid-center section, fourth and the fifth. And what this does, it brings it up here and goes down here and then it forces the fuel back. It sucks the fuel, the unburnt fuel out, but then when the, when the <clears throat> fuel comes in to a two cycle, it comes down here and this is forces it back so it makes a proper, just like a valve in a four stroke. They always make a pipe straight like this. And then once they get the ideal horsepower, then they start cutting it and putting it in the snowmobile. But first it's always, a, and this is even in modern technology. Now, technology, they do a lot on the computer and it can tell a tool, but this is the basic what it is. And then they put a silencer on out here to quiet it down. But this, this is a pipe that kind of makes the horsepower. And this still comes a lot of it from any two cycle and even motorcycles and everything else. This is what they design. And this is how we make more horsepower. And then we can get how we design this stinger pipe is how we get a, how much RPM we can run. And then so we want to make it not too radical so that we can make so that clutches will clutch and power the snowmobile. Is that all right? Yeah. <clears throat> As we go along here, I found this up in Rosso in the back farmer's yard and it's a ZL cast iron cylinder motor. I don't know the exact history of it, but it's kind of cool looking because it has a crankcase induction with a carburetor with cast iron cylinders, and then it has points ignition. But this was used, uh, players tried it. It's a 356 cc motor, and it had stuff on the top here for cooling and sound. So I don't know if it came from a, a little taxi cab or what it was, but I thought the th cool thing about this, it has oil injection. It is still a two stroke, but it was too heavy and didn't make enough power 
for them. I've seen one snowmobile that had this in. And 1967? Yeah, 66, 67. Yes. How, wh when did they even start doing oil injection? Oil injection yeah. That was in the 80s, I would say. Okay. Yeah, because we always pre-mixed. Everything else was all, all pre-mixed. Yep. Then come along and, and the guys at Polaris was having a hard time with J-Lo and Hearth over there to make the exact horsepower what they wanted for motors. So Polaris went over to uh, <coughs> Fuji Heavy over in Japan and they brought over a, a J-Lo, the same size as this, and they built a complete copy of this for 1969. And uh, it it worked fine, but it was still too heavy, and uh, it wasn't didn't put out the power they really wanted, and everything. But it was a good start. So with working with Fuji Heavy, they came up with a shorter stroke twin, and uh, this was the first adventure they tried with Makuni carburetors and dual fuel pumps. Uh, we were a dealer back then, and we had a little problems with heat and stuff like that with the uh, carburetors mounted directly to the cylinders. But eventually they wound up putting uh, rubbers in here so that the vibration of the, of the cylinder and the motor wouldn't foam the carburetors. Then they moved the fuel pumps away from the crankcase because it got so hot, they didn't have to have them right on the crankcase. But this was a very reliable motor. It started so easy and reliability was super great on it. Uh, it's one of their best uh, developments that they ever did. That was the development of of what in 1970 on up, everybody started building, uh, it was such a market then, building motors for snowmobiles. You'll see here's a different, little bit different concept. Uh, guys out, uh, out east, they wanted to build a four cylinder. So they would weld the crankcase up, put it in a barbecue, put a shaft in it, and sit it in the barbecue, bring it up to 500 degrees, weld it up as they went along during the day, and then let it cool down, take it all apart, put a crankshaft in it, and uh, put the cylinders on. The cylinders can move all over. It doesn't matter where they, where they move, they move back and forth. And when you have this on a dyno, you can see the cylinders walking around. That doesn't bother, but the crankshaft has to be super tr true to make it live. And that's the main critical part is in the crankcase. As they went along, players needed more finage. Uh, for cooling, so this is a 73 Starfire Racer. And it's got fins on the crankcase and bigger fins on the motor. Uh, this is just more reliability. And uh, as we progressed, it was a very good motor. Uh, CC wise, they put a lot of power out and everything for their size of their motors. As we go along, uh, we got into uh, things that happened uh, that they needed a little more power, and once they get more power, they needed to have cooling better, so they built these, they called them kind of Weber heads. And what these heads did is cooled where the spark plug was, where the heat was. They were trying to get rid of the heat, and what they had to do is they found out that uh, the only way to really combat it would be to go water cooling. But they still run the 74, 75 snow pro season with fin fin cylinders free air and then sometimes we painted them flat black to try to bring the heat out better that's why this one here is a triple cylinder uh, 650 cc and they got rid of the 800 cc it was just too big for everybody to handle and they get gradually went to uh, <coughs> 650 you'll see the transfers and the ports on them are a lot bigger they went and took and put the connecting bolts to hold the cylinder on up on top so they could get bigger transfers as they went along. A lot of the, a lot of the cylinders and a lot of the stuff that we have uh, went to drag racing and they, they trimmed them down for lighter weight. Kind of sad but it's history as we went along. Players made a couple 600 twins. I think they made, I don't know, they don't know, really say. Um, and about uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they made 10, 12 of them. But uh, it was still free air, and they've made very few of these. There was never any, any production of them. Um, and uh, this is just an example of some of the stuff that they 
cried and uh, the history of it. This here we get into the TX. This is a brand new TX motor, never run. TX250, see how it has the rubber connections here for the, for the carburetor to move up and down. They got the Makunis to work great. Nowadays the Makuni carburetors are really super. They're very easy to work with, very reliable. They put the rubbers on the top here, the fins, to calm the, uh, the noises down so it's quieter. And as they progress, then uh, we use the, these here. Little 250 still had a lot of power. As we went along, players decided that they needed to finally to get to water cooled. Everybody else was water cooled uh, and everything else. So they started using cylinders, water cooled cylinders, experimental. These are experimental cylinders. These are uh, rough casting with aluminum heads, uh, uh, cast iron, mainly to get the horsepower to see what they're at. And then this here is another, another concept of it. Uh, as they went along, they tried to get they went to a different type of, this is a 440 with a single head on it with aluminum cylinders. I've never seen anyone, any of these ever produced, which I don't think it, they ever did. It was still a experimental PLX. I'm so glad that they allowed to find this without scrapping it to show some history. This here is a 340 TXL motor. This is the best motor I think they ever built. It uh, had 38 millimeter Makuni carburetors on it, and it uh, was 78. They, they started building this, and it would beat most 440 motors. Uh, they were racing down in uh, Balsam Lake in Wisconsin on a closed course, cross country course on a lake, and they had an ice ridge. And this little 340, uh, and Monsrud got his motor up to his, I think his, uh, John Deere was out there testing with radar and he got 107 miles an hour. And they thought, oh, that's a mistake. You can't get 340 going that fast. And along come Archie Simonson, he was racing Polaris Stewart. He went over 100 miles an hour too. So here a little 340cc motor can go that fast. And uh, that was stock too. That was, uh, wasn't uh, modified or nothing, no pipes. This is a modified RXL motor that goes in a race sled. And this is a 1979. They went to twin jugs and tried to get more horsepower and it's still water cooled and uh, the way the tune pipes come around and the way the stingers are made a uh, very good design here's a rotex <laughs> this is their first twin it's a 494 and what they found this is uh, not the company skidoo company but uh, another guy found it they could utilize this motor this motor was used in for industry it had the carburetors on the other side and then they switched it around and put single 250 cylinders on here and uh, <clears throat> made it so for racing they, they adapted uh, sometimes uh, two HRs or two HL um, and this was their fancy one they had this this really went and made the yellow machines really really fly so this is their first concept there was private people that did this down out in Idaho Springs uh, Idaho, they um, built it and uh, they knew how to start building pipes and the reason uh, Doug Denner, uh, a lot of it, the concept still came from motorcycles, stuff like that. Here's a single cylinder. This is a Rotex single and this has the twin carburetors on it and uh, as, as you accelerate one HL, it's got the little lever and it accelerates the other one. So it helps out and it's just ramming more fuel in. And with a Tillerson carburetor, there's no float boil bowl or anything like that. So you can tip them upside down or any type you, way you want to run it. Can you do that one more time? I just want to see it from this yep. side. And see, it, it just helps the other one. See, it starts out with the bottom one and then when it gets ready, then it helps the top one to open up too huh. as it goes. It's a kind of a cool setup. It's like a kind of like a twin spool turbocharger yep almost. yep then as we went along uh Kian from japan started making their own carburetors too and they had all the way up to 50 millimeter uh, and this is another uh, ccw concept single cylinder made out of japan as we went along uh, everybody wanted to get into the 
the snowmobile industry because it was doing so well. We were making 600,000 units. And a uh, key coffer from Mercury Marine uh, decided to build his own engine and try to sell it to all our manufacturers. And you'll see how, how his design was made and he offered a lot of really neat stuff. He sold, he finally sold his engine to Bolins and Bolins de Aubrey Rouge uh, used it for one year. And uh, the only thing is it was going backwards kind of and, and some, some of the companies were, were going out of the business because of the gas shortage and everything else and manufacturing, they were making too many of them. Uh, what uh, he did, he did, he did put it in a race sled and a Polaris race sled and won some trophies with it and did very well with it. It was a very good concept motor. It had a really high CDI ignition in it with a surface gap, spark plugs and everything. It put out a lot of power and he had sold to Bombardier. Bombardier bought, wanted to buy this and uh, they made a deal like on a Saturday night and come Sunday, um, Skidoo backed away from it. So it's a really sad deal. And uh, it would have been nice to see this motor develop more. I have one concept here, showing one here of how it was. Uh, this is their racing and the, and the awards they did back in the day. And uh, this one motor I have here is I made it into a free air, it's a 440, but you'll see how the fins are so designed on this, a lot different than everybody else's. But uh, all in all, it was a good concept, good motor. They made them all the way up to 800, 900 cc triples and even single cylinders and everything. They offered everything. Everybody was trying to make motors and make horsepower, but sometimes their prices were too high or they couldn't deliver. And that was a, a sad deal. Here's a Lloyd's motor. This I think was made in Italy. It's uh, again, a lot of finage and everything else. It was a good utility motor. Snow Prince used this and other manufacturers. And uh, the thing is about this, it still the same thing. It didn't put up enough horsepower for what it was. It was more common, just a utility motor as they went along. <clears throat> this one here is a CCW, 716 CC twin. It was uh, another thing they made uh, trying to come out of CCW in Japan. And uh, again, it was a nice big motor, but it didn't have the performance and the reliability that manufacturers wanted. But they were making them for them to make concept motors. As they went along, <clears throat> Kohler was making motors too and they had the four stroke, but then they went into the two stroke. This is a free air 650, three cylinder, very popular. There's uh, <clears throat> some manufacturers use these and uh, it, it worked out very well. They had triple HD carburetors on them and uh, they were very competitive, but it's still, it was uh, really a war eat war on, a, on testing. <clears throat> Along come McCullough. McCullough made a motor too here. This is a 399 twin and the concept of what is uh, trying to sell it to like Polaris. Polaris, I talked to one dyno guy and he says, yes, they did bring this motor to their attention, brought it up, put it on the dyno and it didn't make as quite as much horsepower. Uh, you'll see here it's got the whole cylinder and head is like a like a McCullough chainsaw all in one and they put the carburetor way down on the bottom so they didn't have very good motor mounts. But they took an, on this uh, system here, you'll see it inside, I don't know if you can see it, but through here, there's a little piston that goes up and down. And what this is charging the crankcase. I don't know if you can see it. It's, uh, this is a concept from Europe in the motorcycle industry. And it made a little more horsepower. And uh, it's still something they were trying. They kept working on this for a long time, trying to sell players and other manufacturers. And that's a 399 twin. McCullough also had a big drone motor and this was made for drones to shoot down. And what they, the guys out in New York were trying to do, they were gonna to try to mount this on a snowmobile. And I, I heard it made about 90 horse. 
A drone? What, would that just like go down sewers or something? No, a drone, an airplane, a small airplane. They flew it up in the air and they shot it down. Really? Yeah, and this was for, for in the service and everything else. This, this, they made a little airplane that would fly remote control kind of, and, and they'd shoot it down. They call it a drone airplane. <laughs> this is one of the first drone engines? Well, I don't know if it is the first. No, it isn't the first, but it's just a drone motor. And they used it for aircraft too, you know, other stuff, but too. They call it a drone. As we went along, we were trying to make more horsepower. And this is a single cylinder hearth. And what we did is we epoxied the transfers, filled the transfers in, and then we could see here the aluminum, we full circled the crankshaft so that we could get more compression in the crankcase, push it up into the fuel, into the cylinder. <clears throat> we went and found a little reed carburetor uh, manifold, we put it on the crankcase, and we could add more fuel that way too, in conjunction with the carburetor up on the cylinder, so that when that went up, then this would accelerate too at the same time. Main thing is we're trying to make more horsepower all the time. And that's what it's all about, uh, the speed, the horsepower, and getting it to the track. This here is now is called, a, this is a 634 hearth, but this is called Marvin's Piston Stuffers. And they were made in Merrifield, Minnesota, uh, in, uh, up by Brainerd. And he made uh, these in 68, 69. And what we put them on here, we gain about a horse and a half because it would take a fuel from underneath the piston and force it up again. Uh, very good Kai idea. We used these racing some and it, it worked very well uh, for its day. <clears throat> As we went along, uh, the president of Scorpion uh, went over to Hearth and, and says, want small twin? And he says, we have small twin, we have a boxer, boxer. And he didn't know what a boxer was. Well, a Porsche boxer, you know, the, the, and this was what they came up with. And it's a 493 Hearth boxer. And this was made in 1968. Uh, <clears throat> the concept was okay and everything else, a nice twin, but Player Scorpion couldn't use it because their steering was in the way. So, so Articat used it in 1968 only. They meant the steering to get around this. And so it's in, you'll see that in Panthers once in a while. But they only made that one year. This is a Dahatsu with electric start motor here. And this was made for, they used it in uh, uh, Larson Boat Works over in Little Falls, Minnesota. And this didn't have a recoil. All it has is uh, electric start. And it was a 305cc. They only used it one year. Again, it wasn't as popular as they wanted it to be. It didn't function as well. Uh, and it was just a different thing they tried, everybody trying to get more horsepower and put it out into the market. Here you'll see an NOS Sachs Wankel. This is a real small Wankel compared to the rotary of the 303 and the 294. This is, a, this is how a person would buy it with the muffler and the carburetor and the fuel tank. Back here is a little small little sax motor the same way all set up. It, uh, this is the way it came. It still has a crate board on it and it, that's the way it came. As we move along here we got a hearth motor. Hearth was made in Germany and uh, they were really supplying a lot of motors to the industry but it all died away after 74 because of uh, everybody the <clears throat> were going to Japan because they could get a better deal on the motors I think and everything else and technology was quicker and faster so Hearth quit making motors for a long time and then all of a sudden they started back up again this is a motor made uh, this is their new concept now they do make them for airplanes and and uh, drones and and uh, this is this one was made this is brand new yet this was made for uh, water pump you'll see that the crankshaft is straight it's a straight crankshaft made on here to adapt uh, a pump and then this is a Bing carburetor on it as we go along Articat utilized this motor in 74 75 
And this was their race motor, it was a, Suzuki, a Kawasaki. And they decided to use twin spark plugs to make it more horsepower, they thought it would give more horsepower and more, uh, a better burn. And uh, they made more bigger cylinders and everything else for cooling. They were just on their concept, they were trying on the Snow Pro, they started water cooling. And uh, then this was the last year for Kawasaki, because uh, then they went into uh, Suzuki. These are Kohler manufactured motors. These were made some in, in uh, Ohio and then some were, were made in, in Canada. And uh, uh, they, so some were made in uh, Switzerland, but this is a fan cooled motor, um, 338, 340, and then here's a 340 free air. We use this in Mercury's and uh, racing and consumer sleds. They were a good, reliable little motor and uh, it, it was just fast and furious that they were there in the, in the business for a while and then they finally cut out because of the, I suppose, pricing and whatever. This is the water, first water cool they had and it has a water pump on it and uh, this is just part of what I have for a concept. They changed the water cooling after this. This was one type they used. And then this is a CCW. A CCW was made in Japan, uh, Canadian Curse, right? A small, light, good, powerful little motor. Uh, Scorpion used a lot of these, a lot of the ski roll. A lot of people used this type of motor for their snowmobiles. Back in the day, Chaparral was making uh, snowmobiles in Denver, Colorado, and uh, they decided they wanted to take and make a, a larger, they made some mopeds, small motorcycles, they wanted to make a larger one, so they borrowed this motor from a guy, and it's a Zundap, and they used it uh, up in Denver for a while, and they made some 250s just to try out, and they felt that it wasn't gonna work for them, so they decided to uh, send it back to him, and uh, he loaned it to me so that I could have it on display here and tell the history. Back at about 7980, Scorpion engineers came up with a twin runner ski. And it's kind of a different concept of how, how a ski would work, but it, it, uh, it was a different design. Uh, you, you get it so that you wouldn't rut and, and it wouldn't take you all over the trails. It worked for a little bit. Some people had it, some people didn't. In, in my travels of traveling around, I was looking for, um, you know, odds and ends, and this guy had this, it's called a Rusko uh, power auger up here, made in Crosby, Minnesota. And I thought, wow. And he says, what do you, well, you don't want that. I said, well, yeah. So I uh, went and did some research, and I found this picture in Snowgoer magazine. And uh, I thought, well, see if the guy's still around. So I called up to his house and talked to his wife. And I says, do you remember him building a ice auger? And she says, no, I don't. And I, I, I kind of thought he was dead already, but, and she says, uh, no, you want to talk to him? And he was still alive. So I thought, wow, that's, that's what we want is a history. So I went up and talked to him and he loaned me uh, some of this literature that I could take and make copies of it. And what this literature shows is it shows uh, how he went down and, and made a patent. He made a Canadian patent and then he made a U.S. patent. And how it sets, uh, you jack stand, set the sled down and then put this extra wheel on here and then uh, took this loop here and put it on the throttle of your snowmobile and it was an ice auger. Wow. And he made, uh, he started this in 1970 and he made close to 400 of them. And he made them for four years. And I thought, wow, that's super. And talked to him a little bit. He says, I went to the Inventors Congress in Minnesota and I won second place. And I thought, wow, that's really super cool. And we talked for a little while and I said, well, I hate to ask you, but uh, can you tell me what won first place? He said, first place, well, he says that farmer thought that brought that thing in. He says, I think you called a bobcat skid steer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so to, for second place, that was really something. 
but this is kind of history to me. It's an ice auger uh, utilizing a snowmobile. Was there anything else that was made like that that you kind of add on to a snowmobile to do something else? Well, there was ice augers on, on uh, uh, rear engine snowmobiles. They made a and, and uh, they made it out of uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and uh, called a, uh, and they took and you could just take it, uh, it folded up kind of, and then you backed up and then it, you bent it over and then the, the V-belt twisted onto a pulley and then it went, used the ice auger, yes. Wow. They utilized it. Are we wearing you out? No. I'm just trying to think of a, uh... I mean, I like how this isn't, I mean, it's not like every single snowmobile motor is represented, but these are all special ones to you, and they have good stories. And I like that the 340 outperformed the 440s. When you yes. Were there. And those were, those were in snowmobiles for a long time, right? And the reason they, they went to a 400 then, and the reason they went to a 400 is because the marketing wanted a bigger CC, and yet the motor didn't turn out very well. The 340 could beat it. Or, or stay with it, and the 340 was a really good concept motor. We never had problems with it. We were running a special oil, and, and we would hand, uh, take and have a little jug, and we'd add it to the gas and then shake the sled, and we were running 100 to 1 oil and never burn it down. Wow. So it was a really a good concept. As we go along, this is my Scorpion wall, and this, is, this here is... Our Scorpion dealership, my dad and my brother and I, we first started with a, a used snowmobile and we decided, well, we better get into it. So we called Scorpion Factory and this was in uh, October 20th, 1966. And we made a deal with them to get three snowmobiles and it cost us $1,841. And that was our, our dealership. He, the guy came with a pickup with a rack on the back and he had two snowmobiles on. He dropped one off and we had to go get the other two Crosby, Minnesota is only an uh, hour away from here, so we'd go up and get sleds. And, and uh, we were a dealer. We had a 10-mile radius uh, of the dealership, and we sold a lot of sleds out of there. We were in the sand and gravel business, and so in the wintertime, we would do, uh, it worked out very well for us. As we went along, uh, my brother and I, we started racing snowmobiles and everything else, and uh, we got on the Scorpion factory team, and here's a show of indoor racing where we went up to uh, Duluth Indoor. And uh, it was in uh, November 9th, 29th, 1969. And what it was is a little hockey rink. And so it was so narrow and small, and with the two cycles, uh, come four o'clock, you couldn't even, if you were sitting in the audience, you could hardly see the track, there was so much smoke. And uh, the, our leader that was back then, was name was Len Corzine. And uh, every time there was an accident, there, a lot of, almost every time, there was a scorpion at the bottom of the pile. And the one guy says, where did you get these kamikazes? So that's how we came up with the kamikaze, Corzine's kamikazes. And we were known that for the whole year of racing because I would say not quite half of the guys went to the hospital because uh, broken arms, dirt in the face, mud and everything else. And it was quite challenging. So it, it was uh, quite, quite a racing effort that we did. That is the original sign on the Scorpion factory in about 1977. And the, the square sign back there is original dealer sign in 1967, 68. We got an award for, for a dealership in 67, 68 uh, for uh, over, we sold over 20 sleds and we sold about 35, 40 for a population of 600 people, a uh, little town, everybody and everybody needed a sled. Scorpions, we were a good dealer and we kept up uh, the quality of the sleds and and we had a great time doing it. Wow. 
that's the original scorpion sign that you could put a magnet on it and you could put it on the side of your pickup. Oh, really? Yeah, it was made kind of a plastically and it kind of broke, but uh, that's what we, yeah, that's the original dealer sign. Here's one thing I found in, in, in Wisconsin. This is another sax, a small motor, and it was run into a gear case and then made it into an ice hogger. So I thought it was just really super. So the German motors and stuff like that, people utilize them for this different concepts, and this is one of them. Back when we were racing snowmobiles too, we, this is how the crankshafts came originally from JLO. Then you'll see where we put these pieces in here, and this is full circling them, and this is to make more power. Eventually, they came with a little aluminum uh, metal pieces that made it work as full circled to make more horsepower. You'll see here, this guy's name is John Leonards. He worked at Stewart Atwater and at Scorpion, and uh, he's gone now with a lot of memories. He let me have this, this wheel, this degree wheel. This degree wheel shows a piston and a stroke and the degrees of how you made motors. He says he made four motors from scratch using this, utilizing this wheel. He put the exhaust on here and then uh, intake and he'd just do it by degrees. Instead, nowadays it's all computer. This is the manual version. And uh, it's, it's kind of sweet that he loaned that history to me and uh, so I could pass it on to everybody else. These here are molds. These molds here are, make a cylinder. This is a cylinder out of bull whip. And uh, the mold manufacturer, I knew him, and he would do these molds up and he would make them backwards from the drawings of what it should be. And uh, I talked to him uh, uh, to buy them and have them so I could put them on display. And I want to thank him very much for letting me display this, what he was doing. Uh, <clears throat> here we have a piston. We'll show you the piston here. This is the older piston. And uh, what we used to do is put grooves in or stuff like that to keep the oil. The oil was so bad that we put grooves in the piston to hold the oil. And then we used to cut here the tops of the piston down a little bit to speed up the transfers. And we always used to modify this piston because it was cheaper than a cylinder. And you could always replace them. This is a new concept of a newer piston with Teflon coating, and this is a Polaris piston, uh, as what they use nowadays. Back then we had nothing, no concept at all of, of coating. This here is another free air cylinder made into a water-cooled and a concept, and these were gradually getting into water cooling. This is a piston out of a rotary Wanko. See how it has a, it's how it's shaped and everything else. And then the, this is where the wear pieces, uh, uh, that uh, the rings to seal it. A, a Wanko has a very throaty uh, sound to it. It kind of lopes, and uh, it uh, the, every manufacturer I think had them except I don't had the option to to buy them. Uh, they were expensive, but uh, when we had them, it was really fun. They were. This here is a Scorpion 79 Sting Tunnel. This has never been used. It was brand new. I found this. And uh, you can see how all the wells were factory made. And this was all ready to go be assembled. And uh, I just bought it to show, display how they used all aluminum welding and everything else as the manufacturers would build it. Here's a, a sleigh. This is uh, from Ski Roll. And you'll see they have a torsion bar suspension kind of going up and down on it. See as it goes. And this is kind of a two-seater. One sits behind the other. So a lot of the ones were wider, but this was narrower. So that would follow in the snowmobile track tracks as it went. 
This is a Mercury motor engine that used in their snowmobiles. A lot of its design came from uh, Oddbar Motors, so they incorporated Oddbar Motors. That's why it looks so weird looking. And uh, utilized that, didn't put that much power out. And uh, it was just something they used back then to uh, motorize their, their snowmobiles. This is another concept of a motor. This is called MAG. And this was made with, with uh, cast iron cylinders again. It uh, was used, uh, some companies used them. It was 600 cc. Again, it wasn't very much power and it was heavy. But uh, when they, that's all they can get, that's what they utilized. Here's a big twin made into a free air race motor, 780 uh, CCW. Uh, it, uh, again, wasn't a lot of power on it, but uh, uh, we utilized it. This was came off of the Scorpion. And uh, I remember when the guy had it and he used it. And uh, we thought it was, we had to have more power and more transfers to make it go faster. This is a BSE motor. This has come out of a, out of a <clears throat> motor ski bullet, 1971. Again, the heads are nice and big to cool off. Uh, this was a motor from Japan again, and the concept of uh, making free air, making horsepower. They only use uh, this motor, this free air like this one here, uh, mostly that one year in 1971. Some were or used later on what they had left over and they put it in regular production. You'll see here's a Botel Ski Bird tunnel, made a composite one. You can see how it broke over here. And what they were trying is that everybody was trying to make composite uh, different tunnels and stuff like that, but they didn't have the flexibility that they have nowadays. Nowadays you can, you can bend things around the, the parts and everything else with new ideas. But at least they were trying this, and this was had to be tried 69, something in that era. This here's a triple Arctic cat. This is a lot newer. The reason I put it here was because to show how this guy burnt one down a piston down and how far he run it without knocking the rod out of it. But it sure hammered the piston all to pieces. You can see aluminum shavings all over. This was a three cylinder. 600 with a reeds going into it. This is a thousand cc. See how big this is. And the Articat used this. They even had a, a, a camshaft on the side there to help to uh, keep the vibration away. You'll see up here, and this here, we'll show you this player's cardboard up here, and that is. That is the original crate material. And that was used on the crates and it's called a, a wax material so that they wouldn't uh, uh, get soft and fall off. So they're kind of a waxy one. Here's another one, it's all waxed and uh, original. They still had their model on it and everything else. And they put the arrow on there for where the engine was, for the nose, if it's nose heavy. Oh, okay. So how to lift it. That is original Polaris truckload sale sign. When they got too many of them, they, they sold truckloads. They kicked them off the truckload and sold to persons and they'd take them home and put them together. <laughs> yeah. This here is an Alouette motorcycle. 700 of these were made. They're using lies in a Saks motor on it, single. And uh, they tried to get into motorcycles too. This is, well, I haven't seen too many of these around and uh, it just didn't work for them and they kind of passed on it. It's a 125 cc and uh, back in the day, back in the day, even Artie Cat has tried everything. Uh, we'll, we'll venture in and look at lawnmowers, grass cats. This is a bicycle uh, donated by uh, Dave Gunther from Pequot Lakes. This is Artie Cat, and this was made in France. And they had Artie Cat logo on it and everything else in the mid 70s. And uh, they were trying everything too, just to market and uh, move things around and sell product. That was the name of the game. 
This motor here is a kind of a concept motor. This is made uh, by Jeans Incorporated out of Forest Lake. They were a Motoski Hodaka dealer and uh, they decided to take Hodaka cylinders and make a, a motor out of a race motor. And this is a 100cc, so it was, it was a 300cc motor, but they would turn a lot of RPM, but they had to slow it down, so they used these belts here and then went to a, the crankshaft back here, so they would run maybe the motor at 10 or 11,000 RPM, but the crankshaft itself would come out about, about uh, 8,000 so that the clutches would work. The only thought problem is they made two of these three cylinders and one four cylinder, but they didn't have a class to run in and uh, so they wouldn't allow them so it was uh, but they made the castings and everything else and really a sweet concept is that common to have the cam spin a different no no our, i'll show you a, a yamaha did that too huh. and the motor is designed to run that's the original 71 uh poster flag or what you want to call it it looks weather beaded, but yes, that's what that is the original. And this is a Polaris Trail Rider suit. This is original with a logo on the back. Uh, it uh, very nice concept. Cool jacket. Some of the clothes. This is some of the like 73, 74 that Polaris had, and these were kind of like uh, uh, capes that we wore at the racetrack. And this is Polaris's logo back then, and this was in uh, 68, 69, 70. The suits were all one piece back then, and then once we got into 70, 71, then we were going two piece. Back on engines again, uh, even Sachs made a, four, uh, a 740cc twin, all aluminum for racing. They only made that really one year. And then JLo made this little itty bitty, and that was for the originally what they started out with. The one thing neat about what the Germans made is they made a recoil here and a recoil opening here. So all you did had to do is turn it around and, and the flywheel come off and there was another notch in it so you could run the motor forward or backwards. So it was adaptable to any application. Wow. Back in the day uh, when Hearth made that uh, opposed twin, well JLo made an opposed twin too. This is a 594 cc. And you can see in this picture, it kind of sat right in your crotch when you were on an AMF and, and uh, not too many of them. Uh, players used this for uh, um, Voyager and uh, otherwise it wasn't too much. It was still a heavy motor and somewhere in the TX500. Speedway made a, mo a sled too, the better Speedway. Speedway made a lay down sled. The guy that manufactured Speedway sleds uh, was working at Rupp and they decided to make their own sled and they made it for about three years. This is a, a slide rail suspension called a Mogul Tamer. This was used uh, by Scorpion. Uh, the concept that they found out that players did too. They were using boogie wheels for a long time while Artie Cat was always beating them by five miles an hour. Then they found out that they had to go to a slide rail. And so then players went to a slide rail suspension on the cleats and they gained more speed, five miles an hour. This original 90, uh, 1968, uh, it's insulated down, jacket and pin, uh, uh, bibs, and this was used underneath your clothing, so when you put your suit on, so you keep warm. This was some of the aftermarket clothing that Larson Olson had. And this is a Starfire, Starflame race team by Larson Olson. I was a member of that. Uh, we had some really good, neat clothing and patches. This is some of the aftermarket stuff that you could buy with, with uh, cleats, uh, studs, and, and claws, and, and different things. Speedometers, this is a, a tack, uh, shock absorber kind of deal. Um, and oil concepts and stuff like that. $10. Yeah. This is Brute. Out of Brute, Minnesota, they made their own suits too. 
Uh, this is a break off. The, the guys broke off from uh, uh, <clears throat> players because the text round bottom out and they didn't like the, what direction they were going. They made a brute sled that is water cooled and uh, we'll take a look at it later on how the concept was very good and how it uh, <clears throat> moved on. This is Jim Adema. He was a race guy out of uh, uh, Michigan. He really helped develop uh, Snowjet and uh, he uh, really had a racing, it was, he was the number one guy. He wasn't super fast, he just knew how to drive and get the job done. And uh, he always had good handling sleds and went around the corners very tight and beat everybody. I, I had a very respect for him. I bought a lot of things from him uh, and uh, very respect to that man. Here you'll see a drawing. This is of a little Andy snowmobile. This is Polaris's little Andy. It's a smaller sled. It was a JLO motored uh, that they use. This was concept made up uh, uh, by a young man named Andy Wells. And uh, they manufactured this in uh, 64, 65 in that era, 66. It's super to have the drawing. And I got the signatures of, of Andy Wells and David Johnson too. You'll see the, this is called a grass cat. This was made, uh, Articat utilized these in the mid 70s. They had uh, grass cat push mowers and they had grass cat uh, riding mower. We'll, we'll see the riding mower. They even had a Wankel rotary engine, which is very hard and a magnesium uh, kind of aluminum um, body to it. The Artie Cat was going into everything, and it was it was super cool. As we move along, this is uh, my racing. What I used to race, uh, I used to use these suits like this because then we could see my partner and I uh, had each had these suits. They were chaparral, but we could see each other at the racetrack. And uh, this is. My cut down sled that I used racing, but that was that was the fun days back then. It was uh, really enjoyable. It was uh, the 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 thrill was out there racing and competed, competing, and uh, even if you didn't win every time, it was we met a lot of great great people, and that was more than anything was meeting the super people that were racing and very competitive and respected each other. That was. Uh, I think more than anything, that's what I enjoyed. There's a number four bid that I won. Uh, that was a high point champion uh, for four years in a row. As we go along, this is a little bit more modern. Uh, this here is a, uh, I know a guy from Campsol, Camoplast, and he <clears throat> sent me some designs of the new sleds, new tracks that they have. This is an old track. This is what trailer sled made originally, and it was looks like a, like a lot like a, a skidoo, but it didn't have, couldn't put the rods in here, so it kind of failed because of the more horsepower. The things that failed was because horsepower was gaining so much faster than what the sled could keep up with, and just like dry belts and everything else, it, it just took time. Nowadays they have tracks that are just designed to super. They have everything from studded in the tracks itself that are available to, to big paddle tracks. And as the concept goes, uh, I think the manufacturer owns the patent and, and the mold, but uh, the Camoplast Camsel makes the tracks for them. So these are specifically designed. All these tracks, you wonder why do they put the paddles where they are? Uh, this is uh, really a lot of engineering and how they design them and how stout the rubber is and how soft it is. And it has a lot to do with the cooling of the sled and then besides the traction. You'll see some still have the clips here and some don't have clips. 
and they're wider. It's a 24 inch track. And then the paddles are three, three and a half inch pa tra tra paddles. And they really shovel the snow when you're out west. This shows the tracks. This is the track 1970, a Gates Poly track. And then this is 2010 and 2014, how the concept went as we went along. <clears throat> That 24 inch track, is that for like industrial equipment that uses? No, I think, I think uh, uh, a Titan uses something like that, doesn't it? I think, I think that might only be 20 inches. 20 inch, okay. Yeah, for some, well, whoever utilizes it, I don't know. Oh, I said, geez. Is that a big Yamaha or something? Yep. But they really come a long ways. This here just this here's gonna be my carburetor. I gotta put this all up here yet. But I have a whole bunch of different carburetors I wanna put on here, fuel injection as we went along, uh, different production carburetors and, and everything else that are used. Okay. That's our original Modeski jacket that they used. Back in the day everybody had patches. Everybody had patches and everything else and and uh, there, there's some crazy patches going on. And uh, I want to thank Yamaha for allowing me to uh, show their motor cutaways. These are really terrific in the cases and let uh, show, show the history of Yamaha. This is a 80 cc twin and this is a 120 cc, uh, a 120 horsepower I mean, and a triple and a 130 horsepower triple and a 150 triple and how the cutaway is all designed is it shows the works inside how they work and uh, those are all four stroke and it's just super to see how the works of a of a motor are you know and how tiny and delicate they are in some ways but yet they're strong where they should be this one here the 150 you can see that the the, the, the stub shaft going out is a different ratio than what the crankshaft is. So the RPM of the motor can go higher and then the, where you put the clutch can be lower to be more workable, that you can work the clutch into it. Very super, again, thank you to Yamaha for loaning that to me. That kind of cool? See, they were going to throw that away. Really? Oh, yeah. See, they don't trust nobody, which I don't blame them. <laughs> See, that they would think I would tear it apart and sell the parts and stuff. You know, well, I mean, I just, but I had enough connections and enough people vouch me that it says, yeah, I shouldn't be talking to you. That cool. Yeah. This is the 1966 I-500 race, and that's how the fuel stops were and everything else back in, from Winnipeg down. And this is a 1967 race bib. Yep. 72, yep.
This is another one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Super cool, I think. That's a picture of Minnesota orphans. We had at Waconia show, and those are all the snowmobile manufacturers that snow, made snowmobiles in Minnesota that are gone now. Wow. Just Minnesota. Just Minnesota. Can I send you home with one? If you want to. If you want that, I'll be right back here. I gotta grab something else. That's when I was out in New York, Boonville, New York. A lucky one out there for 40,000 people. Wow. Miss New York gave out the trophies.
got another poster for you too. <laughs> really cool. Cool. Thank you. What was the two plus one? Two cylinders plus one. <laughs> I saw, I saw the X2 came about. It was two 795 cylinder uh, motors. So he put one motors and he says put 795 times two. This here is a 70, 1970 racer, 795 Polaris, aluminum chassis. And this is their first big triple that they got for uh, <clears throat> racing from uh, Fuji Heavy. And what their concept was, once they got the motor, the chassis wasn't wide enough, so how to figure out how to build uh, it in. So they even took and had a rope start on it because of the recoil they were having a hard time with that on their 648 they had all three pipes go out this side and then on the 795 they had the big bigger pipes and so they put one out one side from the other uh, cdi ignition was on it triple hd carburetors and what they did too is they had a so one carburetor pull and the other one had a rod to go in between all three of them they were still running mechanical brakes with aluminum chain case, but the next year we got hydraulic disc brakes. Fuel tank was in the back, and they eventually moved the tank up to the front. This uh, run a cleated track with a cleated uh, slide rail suspension. Uh, this one here has uh, been all redone, and it's a really nice, uh, beautiful, beautiful sled. Uh, the pipes are designed kind of like the, uh, they, I think the first design they came off of was a Yamaha uh, motorcycle and uh, this is how they built pipes eventually like that and then eventually they got into begin the round ones. And this was their first adventure mainly in production aluminum tunnels. They came out and uh, the, the sled came out, uh, they were doing some grass racing over the summer, and they did very well. And then he went to uh, West Yellowstone and uh, went up against the race boys in December, and Skidoo blizzards were there, and uh, they really wiped out uh, a lot of the Skidoo blizzards. They were faster, and they were using their first aluminum production clutch that Leroy Lindblad and the guys up there were also developed and uh, <clears throat> the motor wasn't making a lot of horsepower but the clutches made up for it and got it the horsepower to the track and that was the main thing is the clutching players always had good motors but they weren't as powerful as rotex but the clutching was the answer and uh, that's how they won so many races and that's how much why they did so good it was the clutching that's where a lot of manufacturers couldn't, didn't have their own clutch or their own concept. And uh, the horsepower was going faster than the clutching and the belt, drive belts and stuff. And so this, uh, they were far ahead in that respect. They hit it, did it right. Again, they're red, white, and blue concept where Artie Cat was black and green and Skidoo was yellow. Back then we used to put stickers on, like champion stickers and stuff like that for running spark plugs. Uh, when I was racing too, when you had a big race, you won, 
you would get the contingency money if you were using their spark plugs. Even oil stickers, same way. Uh, they would give you contingency money if you want, and then they could use your photos to show how good everything works. Cool slide. Now we go to the X3. The X3 <coughs> took me four and a half years to buy this from a guy that had it and he bought it uh, from Polaris. And here's a picture of me pulling it out of a shed that the guy had up by Rosso. My wife went with me and she kind of laughed when I was all giggles when I could pull that out and uh, put it on the trailer and hauled it home. Uh, the main reason the uh, it took so long for me to buy this from the guy. He he was afraid I would put it on uh, eBay or something like that. And no, I'm a historian. I want to keep it. So I redid it and uh, made it back to what it originally was. Uh, this is the only sled that I ever had where he gave me a piece of paper and a pen. And, and uh, he had a piece of paper and pen. And he says, uh, you write what you're going to pay for it. And I'll write what I'll sell it for. And we were within $500. So he was pretty happy. And our racing, when we raced for Larson Olson, this is a picture of, that he took it down in the spring. This is all our trophies that our team won in one year. And lo and behold, this is lucky because this is my trophy right here from New York. And uh, the X3 was there. The X3 is a really a, a super sled. It uh, has twin 800 cc motors in it. They run alcohol with a little nitrous. What their concept was going to be was to make it low and lean compared to the X2. And it's on this carrier right now because I, I can I can load it myself and put it in my trailer and haul it to somewhere and show it off. And Mike Baker's laid in here on his belly. They use almost all. Uh, Snowmobile players parts components They had a parachute on the back and the reason the parachute was on the back was because a lot of times you get up to speed The track would blow off and then you'd have no brakes So I'll take the canopy off and show you how he laid in here on this sled and You know everybody says well, how could he do that and you know without worrying about hurting himself or anything, but when you're racing, your adrenaline makes up for it. And uh, it's it just super fun. Your clutch was right there. No guard on the clutch. Had hydraulic disc brakes. Two throttles, one for one motor, one for the other motor. Um, and uh, I'll pull this engine canopy off now too and show you the whole concept of the, how well the <coughs> engineering was done on it. Both motors, like I said, ran alcohol to keep them cool. This motor one run the right direction. This one was in reverse. And what it, what it did is the two chain cases, you had a chain case here and a chain case over there. And the clutches would equalize the horsepower and into one drive shaft. Now fuel tanks were up here. Three pipes went out the front. This one here from the one motor went out here. The other two went out the back. I just think it's super cool. The technology they did back in 1971. It's only 30, when you got the covers on, everything is 33 inches high. So it's about this high. When they went out to test or run it out in West Yellowstone, it snowed before and it was too low and the snow started coming over the over the hood, over the pipes. And so the, the fastest I've heard this to run was 126 miles an hour. And that's at altitude of about 7,000 feet out there. It's uh, really got a history. And uh, that's the main thing. Speed run sleds really have a lot of history of talking about how much engineering work they went into these, how many hours they spent working at these, even, even after hours to get this done. 
and to make something like this. Uh, the guys at Rosso did an excellent job. You don't have to be crazy. Probably help though. No, you just have to have the the, the, the adrenaline rush yeah. to go out and prove something. And that's what it was all about. You're you're proving something and you're trying to sell uh, your product, yet you put that little extra time in because you want to do it. And that's just like when I was racing, it, it was the fun of racing and the challenge and the gratification of going out and competing. That was more than anything. Like I said, the parachute was made just because when the track blew out the back, then you had no brakes. And we're just sliding. And we had a lot of track failures back then when you get really up to high speed. And uh, that's why eventually we didn't have good rubber tracks then until they finally got the concept, you know, and, and better material. That's just like the drive belts. Once we got up there, now we, we got drive belts that'll take 250, 300 horsepower. But it's technology and everything was going so fast. This is the, here's the throttle. Again, one cable, and then the, uh, they call it the coat, coat hanger wire. Goes across and assembles all three of them. See, again, these are Tillerson carburetors made in alcohol, and, and they, uh, there's no um, float bowl on it. So it can set any direction. And so we test them on the side so that they can run that way. We took the chokes out too, so we don't have a problem with the chokes falling in or anything else and or shutting uh, and, and mainly uh, so it's less product that fall hurt. And well, kill switches or? This is a or each. This is a kill switch for each motor, and this is the nitrous. Oh, man. 
And, and they said, we don't know if the nitrous worked that well or not because we didn't have time to really test it, Mike Baker said. He says, so, but we put it on anyway just for the heck of it and thought we'd get a little more out of it. This is a hydraulic master cylinder. And this is, this is a, off of like a go-kart. And it went down and then and it was on a disc brake in here. And that's how it, it, it worked in the chain case. And so you had two chain cases, one on each side, going to one dry shaft that drove the... And if one motor was making more power than the other, the drive clutches would offset that so it wouldn't bind up, you know, like four-wheel drive. Uh -huh. And uh, so <clears throat> there would be more give back and forth. So you can just see how they hung the, the coils down here in the CDI boxes and everything else and how they made the whole frame and everything else. I just think it's super cool. And I put this together mostly on pictures. So it's as close as I know how it was back then. Wow. Seems mean. Never doubt. Now, <laughs> can you get a picture out that way, or should I lift it up a little bit? Or I should be able. I should be getting it. That's all right. I think I'll break nothing. <laughs> okay. And then. We'll pull this off and you can show exactly where you had to see through the carburetors. <laughs> huh? Small, small man? Yeah, they made a mistake too. They made a mistake. Yeah. They, they did all this and made this here. They never really run it. <laughs> he got out there. He put his helmet on. They put, couldn't get the cover off. Are you serious? So he made his first run with no helmet. Then the second run, you'll see he made he he had the the canopy was off. <laughs> yeah, that's a tight fit. Yep. Nuts. I'm yeah. glad I could show you that. That's to me is super cool. Yeah. Holy cow.
It's a 340, it's the 73 Starfire stock. This is the way it came. And this is what I raced in 75. I took over 40 pounds off it. The seat weighed 18 pounds. I put a little rup seat on it, weighed four pounds. Let's see, everybody was, you know, weight makes speed. Uh -huh. So. You can take a picture of that, whatever. Really cool. You had two hinges up front, you take the whole hood off. Just a little pins. You take the pins off and the whole hood comes right off. Wow. Here's a tether switch here. And uh, again, the TX Players TX logo. That's almost like the Indy. Yeah. Hydraulic disc brakes. Just a tachometer, no speedometer. You didn't care how fast you went. It was a tachometer. If the tachometer is where it's supposed to be, you're pulling. Is that tether? Is that from that time too? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Can I tell you a story? Yep. Can okay, I it was, film it? <clears throat> huh? As long as I can film it. Oh, okay. Yeah. We were over in uh, Baldwin, Wisconsin, and I had my sled over there, and we always had to have tethers because what happened back in 72. Uh, we were using them at ASA, but in USSA over at Eagle River, we had a guy on the race, Larson Olson race team. His sled tipped over, the throttle stuck, and it went into the crowd. And hard to say, but it, it killed a six-year-old boy. And uh, from then on, every sled that we was raced had to have a working tether. So we had this tether here, and you'll see, we'll, we'll take a look at it here. We hooked the cord to it, and what it was is just a little pin that pushed out and this rubber held it in, and then the motor would run. Well, anyway, we were racing over at Baldwin, Wisconsin, and uh, by a schoolhouse. And the guy had a snow players like this here. And uh, I got lucky and won the race. And after I got done, I was out in the parking lot, and here come this players all smashed up. It was smashed clear up into here. The whole front end was smashed. And what the heck did happen to you? He says, well, my sled got away and it hit a boiler. I said, hit a boiler? Yeah, he said, when I rolled over, the pin forces to pull the tether, but the pin stuck in. So the sled was going wide open. And it went, took off, went through the crowd, missed the crowd, and went between a, a LP tank and a transformer and headed toward the school. And it hit, a, hit, hit the steel school door into the boiler room. Went through the steel, <laughs> the steel door and hit the boiler and moved the boiler off a little bit too. And it just smashed the sled. But you just figure, <clears throat> you know, these weren't that powerful, but they would still go fast. When you take a 150 pound person off of it, it goes faster. And uh, that's, I seen that, I thought, wow. But the tethers did work. And that's a very unique thing that happened. And uh, we back then days, we had a lot of throttle stickage because of freezing and everything else. So we had to be very careful of uh, frozen throttles and sleds getting away from everybody. So uh, tragedy evolved because of the tether switches was a very good safety thing that happened. Yeah, I was talking to Olav last week and he told me about that story. How he saw that. He was there for that. Eagle River. Eagle River. This has original 10 miles on it. This is a 75, 1975 rotary OMC. You can see on the speedometer and the way it is, that's exactly how, how much it has on it.
under seat compartment. Still has electric uh, start with the battery in the back. Plug wrench, even a even a guide. Ever new guide. As you can see on the speedometer here, it's got 10 miles. One of the guys that worked at OMC took it home, put it in his garage, never used it. It's just so nice that Mike bought it now and that's what he wants to leave it as because the more you ride it, the more it devalues. Cool, cool. Now this is a, this is a start here. And then pull this out for the reverse. Oh, okay. We you never have had have it off to do that. Pull it out and then start it again. Oh uh, no, no. This is a mechanical. Okay. The motor always keeps going the same way, so it's just a mechanical. Okay. And it works in onto the chain case, a okay. reverse. Uh, you'll see that in the modern ones now on a four-stroke, uh, like uh, we'll have mechanical backing. Skidoo still has it. Where the carburetor and the motor is. I think even cigarette lighter. You don't see them. <laughs> so you can smoke as you go. The necessities. <laughs> yeah, what they added back then, yeah. This is a Chaparral drag bike that the race team did in 1973 and used the Fuji motor, their own heavy, Fuji Heavy, and uh, built and designed a, a drag racing bike with snowmobile clutches. And uh, this here is a, how you sit on this and everything else, hydraulic disc brakes. This here is the tube here is the fuel tank because it doesn't take much fuel running Makuni carburetors and, and a twist throttle grip. And uh, it's uh, the way the pipes are set up and everything else, uh, clutches off to the side. They were so quick that they would top out speed-wise within an uh, eighth of a mile. And this one did 84 or 86 miles an hour. And it's only a 500cc triple. But uh, Skidoo, Phil Mickelson, he was running a 650 and uh, he, he did a lot better. And uh, the guy who was driving this, Fred, he says, boy, this is, uh, he made a couple runs with it. And he says, it, it was exciting, but it was quick. See, the players' clutches, they're running. Do motorcycles have that now? No, they, get, they don't. They outlawed them because they were so quick. Really? Oh, sure. Because these would be so quick, it was constant power. So it's or, not about saving space like they don't have the space for it it's they're too fast with us is that cool yeah <laughs> what a cool seat race sled 1973 independent front end Fuji heavy motor. Really wide front, they wanted to cover up all the suspension. So this was made in Denver, Colorado, out there by uh, Arco. Uh, this is as raced. 650cc independent front end and what they did was uh, had just again the tachometer what it was. Fred m modified his uh, his brake so you just have to put a finger on it as he used it. Again this was made by Fuji Heavy. They raced this in the 650 and the 800 class.
VMAX. It's a four cylinder, four cylinder, 750cc. Now this is modified, it's up to a thousand. But because they had a, such a high RPM again too, so then they took and made a crankshaft thing come out here a gear, and then they put the shaft over here for the clutches. So that would slow down, so the clutches could be at about 7,500, 8,000 RPM, but the motor could run 10 to 12,000 RPMs. They produced this sled for about three years or four years, something like that. Yamaha did, very reliable motor. The main thing is the, the weight and the cost. And they had their pogo stick suspension. Yeah, that's a staple of the v right? Yep. Pogo stick. Right? Yeah. Players worked, after they got their Indy, they worked on some pogo stick development tool, but they found the Indy was doing so much better. This here is a Scorpion RD4, and they made four of them. This is the fourth one. RD1 was wrecked when they were experimenting with it during the summer, and two, three are still around somewhere. And this is RD4, and what this is is a concept of a, a fadeaway front end suspension. How oh, it fades backwards into it. Uh, this the concept was pretty cool. They uh, made some other sleds and raced them for two years. Dan and Dave did. This one here is direct drive. See how big the driven is? Mm -hmm. It's uh, And it goes right to the dry shaft. This has got a Cuyuna motor. Uh, Makuni carburetors with CDI ignition. All aluminum cha uh, chassis. Slide rail suspension. Still have a trailing arm. It's kind of a trailing arm, but it fades back. It's a independent front end. And what year? This would be about 78, 79, 79. 78 prototype, 79, they made some uh, cross-country sleds. They, they did make one for production. It was a lot narrower and it was a lot better designed. And uh, that's when uh, Articat owned them and uh, they were, took it to a dealer meeting and after that they went busted and they never went any further. Here's another prototype. This is called a Scorpion Sierra. This was made for 1982. And uh, they would have produced this, but uh, Arctic went busted and they quit the Scorpion line then. Uh, they didn't start building again until 84, I think. 
but this one was a concept one. There's a couple of them out there, different ones. This has got uh, one thing about this here. It's uh, got a, scor a Scorpion gauges, Scorpion Cayuna motor, and most of the rest of the stuff is already cat. But still, they were they were all in favor of uh, working with Scorpion dealers and making more of them. This is a 73 Scorpion Stingerette, and what they were trying to do is make it for the women. They only made it, I think, two years, 72 and 73. They sell many of them? Yeah, they sold pretty good. Uh, this this uh, seat cover are kind of a plastic, whatever, and it's, it is cold, but it, uh, it was cool looking. Women liked it. Uh, handlebars were set back a little ways and it was something that uh, they were selling marketing everybody was trying to market different and scorpion was marketing more for the family and not the performance was there another cover that comes on the back or yes just... over the motor yes okay. it isn't there yeah here you go ladies yeah otherwise you got gas all over your your be your belly and that's how the old ones used to have you used to come into the bar and you're just Your weak. suit smells all gas, and they said, oh, yeah, you've been out riding. Yep. This one here is a Scorpion Sidewinder. This is 1981. This is the last model of Scorpion production they made. There was another company that built them after this, but not too many have produced. This was made of Articat. This was this is utilized in a 440 Articat water-cooled motor. The uh, design of it and everything else, the colors are excellent with the gray and the, and the red and the orange. Uh, this one here is uh, very lucky to have this one. It only has 750 miles on it. Uh, very nice sled to, to ride, just like the LT Gray. And uh, the LT Gray is the same, pretty much the same, only at different colors. Back in 1968, this is Ward's Riverside Caribou. And this is by Ward's, uh, Montgomery Ward's and stuff like that. This was sold, this was imported from Sweden. It looks a lot like a skidoo, but the thing is, it's, it's a lot different in a lot of ways. It had grease fittings, a lot of places, and everything else. Three-point uh, motor mount, uh, had a, even had a, a, a handbrake operation to lock it in. Saks German motor in it. A lot of grease fittings on, a, on everywhere, and even had a tow hitch in the back, all made up, a real solid one. And this had center drive to offset what Skidoo had on their two drive uh, to uh, keep away from the patent. They only made it really one year that I know of.
This is one of the best. I don't know if you can get a picture of this. This is one of the best um, <clears throat> posters that Artie Cat made. And that is originally from a bar in Wisconsin. And all they did is pull up, pull the sled up, and had the patrons come out. And it wasn't professionally done or nothing. And you see all the different suits, the different sleds lined up, different quality. And how to empty a watering hole, come and look at the new Artie Cat. Just super. I don't know if you can get a picture of this. This is a, a Alouette villain. This was made, in, I think, in 1976. And this has a single, like an alpha now, a single wear bar on it in the track. And it was unique in, in, in a lot of ways in that way. And then they had a shock absorber with a spring on the uh, ski. But this here concept was the first one that we know of. And then now Articat has adapted to their Alpha Mountain Sled. I don't know if you want to do anything on the Brute. This was after Scorpion Bottom. But this is a, a lay down, water cooled, Fuji motor. They moved to uh, Brute in Minnesota. And there were six or seven guys from uh, Polaris went down and, and developed this. This uh, sled, and, and uh, this is a Scorpion version with Makuni carburetors, but they had uh, Salisbury clutches, and the motor was making ho more horsepower than the clutches could keep up with, and they exploded a lot of them. Uh, the main thing is they were very fast, and the, and the clutches weren't, didn't have the capacity to uh, keep up the horsepower they were making. And they won a lot of cross-country races. This is a brute sled, and they were in production from 72 through... 74 and scorpion bottom in 75 and they redid this one 340 and they had a triple 440. their water cooling their first 72 had a radiator right in the dash and now this one had extru uh, extrusions to the back of the tunnel for cooling they run a rubber track and a very decent sled See the gauges out. You got scorpion gauges and both a tachometer and a speedometer with with a water temp gauge. And 